It has been my pleasure to watch my next guest uh, go from being a brilliant and talented writer to a brilliant and talented writer and uh, something of a media mogul. If he, if he doesn't mind my saying, you may well know his work. If not, you should. Nathan J. Robinson is the editor and publisher of, uh, of Current Affairs magazine. He is also a columnist for The Guardian. His work has appeared in The New York Times, The Washington Post, and all sorts of other good places. He's a graduate of Yale Law School, although we do not hold that against him. He is a sociologist, and uh, he has a lot to say about, among other things, the upcoming primary, and he joins us now. So Nathan, first of all, welcome back to the program. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction with some high pressure embellishments to live up to. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, but just relax. Um, okay. 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 Um, let's start with this. Nathan, I know how prolific you are, but you just published through Current Affairs a book of dreams? I, I have published two very weird books in the last month um, because I, so I've been doing, I'm a political writer generally, and I do serious electoral analysis too much of the time. Uh, but I also have a, a very odd brain and there's part of it that, that has been yearning to escape. And so I, I keep a, a dream diary. I write down every dream that I have and, and my, I, I have very, very odd dreams. And, um, and so I, I I write them all down and I have compiled them all into a little book. Um, and and often often reading people's dreams can be boring, but I think I think people might in, enjoy mine. They're, they're, they're more like little stories. They're sort of surreal little stories. Um, so it's kind of a collection of flash fiction. But then the other book that I that I put out, which I don't know if you've seen, is called My Affairs, and it is a fictitious memoir from the future written by my 87-year-old self looking back at my career in the magazine industry and how we built socialism together. Wonderful. Well, 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 it reminds me of, I, I saw it, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at it. It reminds me, and I'm sure this was quite intentional on your part, of those 19th century books, Edward Norris or whatever, mm -hmm. News from Nowhere and, yes. and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, about the dreams, by the way, I started to write, just, I started to write my dreams down many years ago, but I found that my own dreams fell into two categories. Either they were utterly altering the nature of reality and there were interdimensional portals like uh, Catalonian arches and all humanity was levitating 10,000 feet above the ground, or I was trying on pants. You know, there was nothing. <laughs> yeah. Pants, arches, pants, arches, right. more and pants. So who, nobody would want to read this. And Jack uh, Jack Kerouac wrote a book of dreams, but uh, I don't remember being, I, I think I, I will be more taken by yours. A, a, as for the future, so we did implement socialism in we your- got it 80s. done. Oh, good. Good work. And uh, speaking of socialism, before we go any further, you have a book coming out when now? December? I do. December 10th. So pre-order it now from St. Martin's Press. It's called Why You Should Be a Socialist, and it's about why you should be a socialist. Okay, well, I, uh, I encourage everyone to pre-order Why You Should Be a Socialist by Nathan J. Robinson. First of all, uh, uh, as we move on, Nathan, uh, let's talk a little bit about the um, about the primary. You've been writing a lot about oh, the primary, yeah. and primarily about the distinction uh, between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And I know that has gotten to be online, at least, something of a heated topic in oh, yeah. certain corners. So uh, first of all, just like <clears throat> summarily, if you would, your thoughts. Okay. So I, I think there's a, a real reason why the, the debate about whether the two are different and how the two are different is has sort of bubbled up and gotten more heated recently, which is that Elizabeth Warren has been started polling very well, right? And some polls has been the the front runner. People have called her the front runner, even. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's obvious at all. But um, uh, but but certainly is doing better in polls than before. And now there's a very serious sort of contest between her and and Bernie Sanders. Um, 
And uh, and I think a contest for progressive votes, I should, uh, should be clear. And so now, you know, when Elizabeth Warren was polling at, you know, 5%, it was very easy for those of us who are very strong Bernie Sanders supporters to say, you know, oh, we like Elizabeth Warren, you know, Chief, you know, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, wonderful, wonderful. Um, but now that there is a real serious question who's going to win this primary. It's very important to discuss the differences because the pitch that people from the Warren camp are going to be making very strongly to people on the left and the sort of center left is if you like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren is just that, but younger and female and, you know, and better and more pragmatic. Um, and and with a better command of policy detail, right? That's going to be the very strong pitch. And in fact, you know, if the, if it's true that there are no real substantive ideological differences, then you should probably vote for Warren, right? Because you know Bernie Sanders is just old, right? You know, okay, if that's the difference. So the play, if Elizabeth Warren is just young Bernie Sanders, right? Then right. You, know, you know, obviously you should vote for her. But I don't think that's in fact the case, and I think that people can easily be, you can easily be sort of fall into thinking that's the case, which is why it's so important for those of us who think there is a real difference to right now explain very clearly what that difference is and why it matters. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's right, uh, fundamentally. And I guess I should say uh, it's gotten so oddly heated in a way, in my experience. Here's what I mean, for example. At one point, I think on this show or another interview I did, I said, uh, you know, I'm a, I support Bernie. Bernie is ideologically closer to my beliefs. He's expressing what I think needs to be expressed in our politics right now. Uh, but a universe, I think the language I used was something like a universe in which Elizabeth Warren becomes president is a lot better universe than the one you know, we live in now, or we would could anticipate perhaps with some other candidates on the Democratic side. And even that, I mean, that got a heated response from Bernie supporters. I mean, I was employee number five on his first presidential campaign. You know, I mean, it's not like I don't have Bernie credentials, but uh, I think that Democrats uh, and liberals and even people further to the left, uh, we sometimes forget that we are also human. And that part of the human process is to mix up uh, multiple things, in particularly in identification with another human being. So uh, the idea that we might, for example, I met Elizabeth Warren a number of times. I like her very much. Very bright. I think she's done enormously good things. I think uh, she. Uh, I really do like her very much. But I just feel the choice of a candidate is. Uh, has a lot to do with what they say. When one candidate says, uh, I'm a capitalist to my bones, for example, and a, another candidate uh, has a different view, says I'm a democratic socialist, that informs my vote not as a litmus test, but it, it, it helps me judge which of these people as president would articulate a different vision for society, the vision that is closer to one I want to see, which doesn't mean that I want all boutique clothing shops to be replaced by state-run, you know, outlets producing, you know, Mao uniforms. It just means that I think we need a larger social and public economy. So, uh, you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do. But I, one thing about it that I think we have to be careful of is just thinking that the difference is w whether you call the same thing democratic socialism or social democratic capitalism because there is a there is a sort of um there is there's a way of talking about this that de-emphasize that ends up de-emphasizing the Sanders Warren difference because it's essentially a difference in how they choose to describe themselves, but would say, but they're both talking about if you talk about what their policies are, um, they're pretty similar would be the uh, argument. Yeah. And uh, you know, and in fact, if we say we should look at how people talk, yes, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders ultimately apply 
different labels to themselves, but they advocate a lot of the same things. And the centrist candidates are attacking Elizabeth Warren over health care, just as they're attacking Bernie Sanders. So the question is, are there many underlying differences other than that rhetorical framing, which I do think is important, as you say, for the for the sort of difference in vision. But what is that difference in vision? Uh, what would it what would it really mean? And also, I think it's important to go beyond what candidates say because every single candidate says what they think people want to hear in order to get elected and what they think the electorate is in the mood for. Even Bernie Sanders has become more radical in his rhetoric as as it's become more possible to sound more radical. Um, so I think one of the very, very important things that you have to do is not just look at what they're policies are, what their plans are. You know, Elizabeth Warren puts out all these big plans. Um, but also, what is their record? And, you know, ha you have to look at who a person is and what they've been doing with their life and whether, because one of the fundamental things is if every politician is going to tell you what they think you want to hear, how do you know who to trust? How do you know who's actually going to follow through on the thing that they say. And you know, I wrote very critically of Pete Buttigieg in March, over a long thing saying you cannot trust Pete Buttigieg. He is saying a lot of radical stuff now. He stopped now that he realized that it sort of wasn't working. Um, but he's saying a lot of radical stuff now, but he is a McKinsey consultant. He is from that world. He does not care about you fundamentally. He is a he is a he is a he is a careerist, and that is what his record shows you. So don't listen to his rhetoric. Look at it. Look at his past. Well, you know, as for Pete Buttigieg, the uh, your piece on 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 Buttigieg, which I, I read at the time, uh, I, I think the main, I'm sorry, the main takeaway I got from it, the tell, as it were, in that piece, you read his uh, autobiography or whatever his mm -hmm. book, and. Um, uh, good for you. And um, at one point, that was not we, good for me. <laughs> yeah, well, good, better you than me, I should say. But at one point, he says in it, um, if I recall correctly, uh, I wanted to see how the world worked, so I joined <laughs> McKinsey. So I joined McKinsey. Yes, yeah. he does. He does now, say that. In my corporate world, I've worked with all these people. You know, I, in my corporate, I, I, you know, I've been a consultant. It, it, you know, it's that to me was the most. Uh, amusing of all the things he said. Uh, and I know people felt when you wrote that piece, you got a lot of pushback. You got, as, as one does, when one writes, and um, a lot of people saying you were being unfair to Pete and he had a vision of the future, but I will yeah. give you this. I think you've been vindicated on that one. <laughs> yes, I'm completely right about Pete Buttigieg, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I mean, you read the autobiography, right? And uh, first off, I mean, I really, really didn't know what Pete Buttigieg was about when I read the autobiography. And it was through reading his self-presentation in the autobiography that I understood some very clear things about him, which is, to me, you know, the, to be on the left, you have to answer the, you have to know the answer to the question, which side are you on? And you have to know the answer to Alexander Coburn's question, is your hate pure? You know, you have to have a real strong sense of solidarity and a sense of what we're fighting against and what we're fighting for. And what you saw in Pete Buttigieg's memoir is a guy who just doesn't even comprehend that, right? So, he, you know, he talks about when he got to Harvard, and he's like, I used to, oh, I used to walk by the, uh, the the student labor movement protesters on my way to have lunch with governors, and he talks about them. He talks, he calls them social justice warriors, by the way, right. which is a right wing term, and he doesn't even show any consciousness of what the labor issues at Harvard really were about and the fundamental inequality of that institution and why students were fighting. Then they didn't seem to consider maybe joining them. And that sort of runs through his entire career, you know, as mayor. He's not, he doesn't understand, you know, South Bend is a very unequal city, a very racially unjust city. No consciousness of of those of those issues. It's all about like improving the, the Wi-Fi. He had talked about like uh, smart sewers, you know, Wi-Fi connected sewers. 
right? It's all it's all that kind of crap. Um, Literally, and, yeah, yeah, right, right. It's Wi-Fi. Uh, it's Wi-Fi enabled crap. Uh, right. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I, I, and again, we're talking with Nathan J. Robinson, writer and editor and publisher of uh, Current Affairs. Um, and I brought yeah, the fascinating thing first of all about Pete Buttigieg being this. Uh, this blind to this dimension of human life is that, as you well know, he is the son of a Marxist uh, professor, uh, Gramsci, uh, expert in Antonio Gramsci, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there's certainly no, and that doesn't oblige him to hold any ideology whatsoever, but to be unaware of this current of thought is striking to me. But I, Nathan, I brought up Buttigieg for another reason, having to do with this primary debate. And, and, and again, I, I don't like to classify people and then judge them based on the categories. But on the other hand, you know, you're a social- I do, so you can, I can well, do that. Well, you know, it's a dimension <laughs> of life, right? Along with many other things. So, it, 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 and that's sociology and, and you study sociology. So, um, so it's not irrelevant, let's put it this way. No. And and I think to what you know, a number of us have written, and Thomas Frank has written a couple books about this, other people have written about uh, the Democratic Party morphing no. from a party of, of the working class, at least uh, to in a certain sense, uh, especially during the FDR era, uh, to a party of the professional class. So you have the Republicans putatively as the party of the 1% or 0.5%, but uh, in terms of the interests they represent, you have the Democrats perhaps as a party of the top 10%, then you have a battle for the remaining 90%, but yeah. culturally, and this is where I think this gets into the issues of the primary, where it gets into the heated online debates, where it gets into the question and misperceptions of electability in the American media. Uh, culturally, Pete Buttigieg, uh, uh, by birth, I think probably, uh, Elizabeth Warren by adoption. Now, I've had personal conversations with Elizabeth Warren about her growing up in Oklahoma, me growing up in upstate yeah. New York, or, you know, meeting people in Europe who are from your hometown. I mean, you know, she's very personable in yeah. that way. Um, and her working class roots are authentic. And, but, but there is, I believe, within the Democratic Party, voters, power brokers, think tanks, media allies, a pitch, there are multiple pitch battles, but a pitch battle between the uh, insider, uh, Ivy League educated uh, class of experts, politicians, and advisors, and media allies, and the sort of uh, what they might view as the great unwashed masses represented by a Bernie Sanders or uh, many of his voters. So I think much of it, much of, mm -hmm. for example, the revulsion in the centrist side, the hostility toward Bernie Sanders and his supporters comes from a sense that these are outsiders storming the castle. And yeah. I don't know what you think of that, but. And that's one reason that among people in the professional class, Elizabeth Warren is far more acceptable than Bernie Sanders, because Elizabeth Warren, even though the rhetoric, a lot of the rhetoric may be the same on the campaign trail, is someone who has spent decades at Harvard Law School, right? And someone who has spent decades at Harvard Law School, that confers in the mind of people in the professional class legitimacy, reassurance. You're not, someone can't be scary to much of a degree if they're from Harvard Law School, which is why there's an interesting article just out in Vox where uh, they interviewed a bunch of Wall Street people. And there are a bunch of Wall Street people about Elizabeth Warren, right? And it was all these these people on Wall Street who were saying, well, actually, we su I support Elizabeth Warren. And the reason is because I think sh we can work with her you know, we can we can survive. She's not actually our enemy. She's sort of our enemy, but she's kind of one of us. So it, it is she is within the realm of the acceptable for Wall Street. Whereas Bernie Sanders, I mean, there's an article in 2016 about a couple of people on Wall Street who supported Bernie Sanders. They were like real eccentrics, like no, and they were like nobody else on Wall Street supports Bernie Sanders. I'm the only one that I can I can find. He's just toxic. He's loathed, right? And I feel as if there is this this I. I worry you could judge people a lot by who their enemies are. And yeah, people like Jamie Dimon hate 
Elizabeth Warren, right? People in the one percent, but not or the top. 0.01 percent, right? right? But there are plenty of people who are in the very, very or the upper middle class, who want to maintain the privileges of the upper middle class and do not fundamentally care that much about the interests of working class people. Those people find Elizabeth Warren tolerable. And it concerns me, and they hate Bernie Sanders, right? Those are, those are the places where you know they really, really dislike Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders shames them. He hates them. He's made it very clear that he hates these kinds of institutions, right? Um, it, it was encouraging to me that Mitt Romney just said, oh, all of my Senate colleagues are friendly, except Bernie Sanders, he just scowls. And it reassures me to know that Bernie Sanders is uncomfortable in the Senate. He doesn't like the Senate. He doesn't like these elite institutions. He wants to spend time around ordinary working people. I believe, and I think Elizabeth Warren could prove Prove me wrong on this, but I believe you are suspect if you have spent too long at Harvard Law School because no reasonable, compassionate, decent human being should want to spend decades at Harvard Law School. Well, you are more familiar with that world than I am, so I'm going to have to take your word for that. And by the way, I am the interviewer here and not the interviewee, but but I could tell you some personal observations about Bernie from working with him that would reassure you even more in that regard, in terms of this, this level of discomfort, it's genuine, and uh, uh, he's obviously learned over time. But and I found it quite endearing when I was <laughs> when I was oh. working for. Can I, yeah, can I ask you about that? Because I, 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 so it is, it is some. I have a sense that he kind of dislikes having to be in politics. He, he doesn't. He does genuinely feel like he's he's reluctant to run for president. Like he feels he he has to, but it doesn't. It doesn't seem like. And and I was really encouraged by the fact that you know everyone's saying this. Oh, this cycle he has to talk about himself more. He has to tell <laughs> his story because he didn't last time, and he's reluctant. But we've got to persuade him. And in fact, his campaign has ended up doing something that I think is brilliant, which is he does. Doesn't really talk about himself more, but he does make more emotional connections with voters because right. he talks about people more. So instead of elevating his story this cycle around, he has decided to elevate the stories of ordinary working people. And I think that's a brilliant way to have the personal connection without having to say it's about me. So uh, I'll tell you one quick story. So, like I say, I was one of the early employees on the campaign. Obviously, he already had allies, many of them, you know, in an inner circle and everything else. So I flew to Washington, and he took me out to, I don't know how much of the story to tell you, but I was wearing a T-shirt oh. with a, the name of a punk band I used to play with on it, and torn jeans, and a jacket. Excuse me, what? <laughs> and and uh, I got a text, Bernie wants you to come straight from the airport to the <laughs> Senate office bill. To meet him outside. Yeah. So I met him outside, like dressed. I, for, well, I had to go through, yeah, it's a long story. Anyway, it was, he didn't even notice, first of all, how I was dressed. Then he took me to dinner. And as we were walking over to the dinner, because he could still do that then, I guess, he said, You know, I love writing. I was the writer, right? I was like his, mm -hmm. his writer. He said, I love writing. Maybe I should be the writer and you should run for president, is what he said to me. And I said, I don't think I have the personality for it. And he gave me this look like for a second that was scathing, like, is this guy effing with me? Is he like insulting me? It's like, no, no, it's just a joke. It's just yes. a joke. But yeah. there's a part of him that, yeah, you know, I mean, there's a part of him that's amazing, that loves connecting with people. He, and he genuinely loves connecting with people. It's the BS part of it he doesn't like. You know, mm -hmm. there were times when uh, a time when we filmed him doing a town hall and when the cameras went off and he was just talking to his students one on one. He was amazing. I was like, why aren't these cameras on? Um, but he just the thing that's great about that I love about Bernie as a human being is that he really, you know, people started saying, well, what's he like? Well, you know what he's like. What he's, what you see is what he is, and he's a genuinely authentic human being who, whatever his flaws and limitations, we all have him, uh, is uh, authentically not interested in the trappings of power, status, 
authority. And that to me was always his, his greatest quality, truly small d democratic quality about him. I, I, funny small story for me is I had in the, in the dream book, I had one dream where I got an interview with Bernie Sanders and I was trying to put his lav mic on and I was fumbling with it and he was getting really annoyed and then I broke it and we couldn't do the interview and I never got the interview and it was a horrible dream, right? One of these things where you get the opportunity of your lifetime and you blow it. And then I talked to Brianna Joy Gray, our former <laughs> editor, who is now Brianna, uh, his press secretary, and she says, that's funny because Bernie hates lav mics. And I think that's so, that's so, I kind of knew, I kind of had this subconscious sense that he is the type of person who hates the BS. Like there are some people who love a microphone, right? Any opportunity to have your voice amplified. Uh, but I love that he just like really doesn't like the whole, like having to do these piles of interviews, having to do, he frustrates him. He has genuine contempt for media institutions in a way that I find so reassuring. And that's what gives me the trust and confidence that when he is in the White House, he will in fact fight the institutions rather than becoming part of them. And I can, I just, I can never get that confidence with Elizabeth Warren, I just can't. Well, <clears throat> and that's, uh, you know, always, <clears throat> excuse me, always the question one gets about as someone Power is multidimensional, right? It doesn't flow from the presidency down. You know, they're dealing within a matrix of forces. And the question, how hard will they push back, is a critical one. I mean, I think that Bernie uh, challenges the fundamental assumptions that underlie some of these institutions and some of the fundamental beliefs. I'm not saying Elizabeth Warren doesn't, but I haven't seen evidence that she doesn't. I, you know, Bernie's critiques of the media are longstanding and they reflect his understanding, his awareness that we're living in a sort of network of illusion. <clears throat> my favorite moment, one of my favorite moments in the 2016 campaign, and I was with the press at the time, was when Rachel Maddow did a ta town hall with him and she said, well, if you weren't a politician, what job would you like to have? And he said, president of CNN, because you wouldn't get this nonsense you're getting now. And the press guy went crazy. I mean, it was hilarious. And because they got it. I mean, yeah. I, I thought that to me was like the best possible answer. I just think you have to have a really high threshold as a politician that we can trust you. And what reassures me about Bernie has been doing this since he's 18, basically, saying the same thing since he, since that time. You know, he was getting getting dragged away by the cops at civil rights protests from when he was young. <laughs> now, again, it's not totally disqualifying, but the fact that Elizabeth Warren spent most of her life as a Republican, which I think the Republican Party is like a racist institution, right? I think it's a, a, a deeply reactionary racist institution that being part of it and not noticing that is just shocking, right? The fact that she did a lot of work for corporate clients um, and the way that we get little hints, like, you know, Harry Reid just said about, um, her on Medicare for All, he said, uh, oh, you know, something like, you know, when she gets into, so, like, she believe all that stuff on single payer? Oh, well, I think, I, I know Liz, when she gets into power, I think she'll become a little more pragmatic, right? And that's the sort of thing where you, which should really raise, set your alarm bells going, which is pragmatic means that what you're saying now is not in fact what you're going to do. And so we absolutely have to have someone where you have complete rocks. It's the situation is too urgent to have anyone who you have anything less. I mean, as much as possible, you need complete rock solid conf confidence that they are who they say they are. Well, you know, we only have a few minutes left, but where that gets me to Nathan J. Robinson <clears throat> is theory of change, as we all see now. Everyone says, well, you know, Liz is from, uh, uh, or, or whomever <clears throat> is pragmatic. They'll get things done. Whereas Bernie is just so out there, you know, he's, nothing's going to happen. And yet, interestingly enough, as you pointed out earlier, the Wall Streeters and others who have a financial interest in presumably seeing a Warren or a Sanders fail are much more hostile uh, to Sanders, which suggests to me that their assessment is that he could be more effective than than the insiders are telling us he could be, number one. Number two, um, now you can, ch I, I share Bernie's 
uh, theory of change, which is organizer in chief, as he now says. It's one of the reasons I signed up with him to be. I, I think that can work. I think that will work. Well, but uh, you can have a different one. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, and I say I like Warren a lot better than a lot of the other candidates oh, yeah. out there. But I need to hear from every single candidate who presumes to lead a nation and a party and a process of change how you're going to make that happen. Now, I've heard it from Bernie. Bernie yeah. has said, we'll get a million people on the Capitol Hill lawn. Bernie has said, we'll do organizing, we'll do calling. We'll fight Democrats who oppose us. That's another key, right? right? If that they is oppose key. this agenda, I am going to put my weight behind throwing them out of office. Right, which is a powerful inducement not to oppose the president in the United States. So uh, I've heard, I haven't heard from anyone else. <clears throat> Everyone who's telling me uh, they want somebody who's going to be pragmatic is telling me they want somebody who will compromise with powerful Republicans and conservative Democrats, which to me is not pragmatic at all. The evidence of the last 12 years shows that. Uh, to me, pragmatic is getting those people out so that you'll get people in who'll do something. But your thoughts? Yeah. So I think, in fact, one of the gigantic mistakes and the lessons that we have to learn from the Obama administration's failures is that there is a huge difference between policy and politics and that there's nothing pragmatic about just thinking about policy and not thinking about politics. Not thinking, and by politics, I mean political power. I mean the movement that is behind you that for that forces your agenda through. And I wrote an article called On Law Professors as Presidents. Hmm. And I noted the interesting fact that Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Elizabeth Warren, if we if Elizabeth Warren got elected, it would be like 30 years of people who have all been law professors. Noah, you know, obviously Clinton, you know, ran for governor soon after he didn't teach law for more than like a couple of semesters. But you know, they all lawyers and law professors. And I think that is important because law professors have a wonkish view of things. Mm -hmm. They see puzzles, they see policy puzzles, and they're like, how do I solve this policy puzzle? How do I make all the little parts of the contraption work well together? And the more intricate it is, the better, which is first off bad for messaging. And you see that in some of Elizabeth right. Warren's plans. But um, but but there is no consideration among law professors because it's considered not relevant to the law uh, of how do you actually get stuff done? How does social change happen, right? That question was never once asked during my time in law school. I took classes on you know poverty law and on you know things that had very strong social implications. But how do you actually get how do you change people's minds? How do you organize people? Organizing? Non-existent. It's nothing. It's not there. People don't even know what it is or how it works. Well, you know, <clears throat> the fascinating things to me about that, <clears throat> the other thing that comes to mind is that uh, law professors, case law and so on, from what I understand, I mean, there's a dimension of moral abstraction to it. You're arguing one side or you're arguing the other side, but the notion uh, that one side might be right and one side might, might be wrong, I assume is frequently somewhat uh, subordinated to the question of, you know, how you succeed, how you, how you practice, how you argue your case and so on. And the second thing that I, you know, I wrote a piece for the American Prospect, I would have liked to write it differently, but, you know, uh, on, um, there is an academic culture of social engineering. You may recall many years ago, yes. communism was referred to as the engineering of human souls. Well, the new engineers of human souls, <laughs> arguably, are the Ivy League professors who designed complex testing uh, institutions for which individuals must qualify in various yeah. ways. And when you have means testing or any other form of testing, you need a class of testers which and test designers, which is a form of job protection for, uh, for this Ivy League force or cadre. And so it seems to me that must fit into your thesis somewhere as well, that as long as we have, uh, a, for example, a Democratic Party that believes in governance by uh, sort of 
uh, academic expertise, not that it, I'm not being anti-intellectual here, but solely by academic e expertise that or primarily that you will have something missing in the in the other dimensions of human existence. There are genuinely people in law in the law teaching world who think that the the longer a law is, the more interesting uh, it is. Who are fascinated, but because there's just so much more, it's so much richer because the text of the law. So a short law is bad, but a 50 page policy document, a 50 page policy document, that's good. That shows you're serious. Whereas if you think about it, actually 50 pages, complex means testing, this sort of stuff. If you think about the people who actually have to interact with the law who are not lawyers, it makes it a nightmare rather than a pleasure, right? It's a pleasure for you because you enjoy legal texts and little puzzles, but it's not a pleasure for anyone who has to try and figure out the rules themselves. Um, and I come from the perspective that law and our institutions should be intelligible to ordinary people. So the fact that Obamacare was 800 pages, that's bad. That's a bad, you shouldn't have that. It's mystifying. It makes people feel alienated from government. Um, and then the other part of it is there is an element of legal education that consists of deprogramming your moral compass. Right. Thinking like a lawyer is, is learning to see all sides. Now, it does help you learning to see all sides because it helps you put together better arguments if you're a fighter, right? If you, I mean, I am a better advocate for the left because I understand the right arguments. So my legal training has helped me to be more forceful for one side. And it does help you sort of like, you know, when you, when you're a corporate lawyer, if you understand a little bit about uh, what the, uh, you know, what the, the, what the other side is thinking, you know, it does help you. So, um, but this is the thing for a lot of people, this process of learning to see all sides reduces the, the, the or eliminates the question entirely of whether one side is clearly right and, and whether justice is is a is a real thing that has to that has to be pursued and whether it's legitimate. It becomes equally legitimate to re represent Chevron as to represent the people who are you know the, the who are living in the world that Chevron has destroyed. And it worries me that Elizabeth Warren has actually blurred this distinction when she talks about her corporate uh, legal practice where she said, I worked on a settlement for, uh, I think, Dow. Um, Corning. Uh, Dow, Dow, yeah. Um, I believe, yeah. Well, it was, was it, or, uh, yeah. It was a chemical company and, uh, you know, accused of, of creating breast uh, silicone implants that, uh, that uh, you know, caused uh, right. uh, medical problems for women. She said, I worked on the settlement for the women. She worked on it for the company, but it's like, oh, but it's all equal. We're all participating in the, in the, in the law. So there's nothing morally wrong. There's nothing abhorrent. And in fact, at law school, it would have been considered very strange to say, like, it is wrong and evil to go and represent someone like Harvey Weinstein or someone like, you know, or, or an entity like uh, like Exxon or Chevron. Where, of course, the business of politics is ultimately to choose right and wrong. Unfortunately, ah! we're going to have to leave it there. But so Nathan wrong. J. Robinson, editor and publisher of Current Affairs, commentator, author of the forthcoming book, oh, Why You Should Be a Socialist. As always, my friend, a great pleasure talking with you. And thank you for coming Good. on the program. Can I also just say my Twitter feed, uh, at Nathan J. Robinson, I've got the two books for free, My Affairs and The Dream Diary. People can get them for free. I'm giving them away. A so. bargain. You, you won't <laughs> beat anywhere. So again, thanks a lot, Nathan. All right. Always a pleasure.